Football's back. Week one's back. I'm back. I'm back. Andrew's back. Adam, not back. He's sick with the vid, but he'll be here next week. Every single Wednesday, we'll be hitting you with our rankings for the upcoming week, okay? The way we'll break it down is this. We'll have a running back debate section where we'll go through our top 36 running backs. We will have a wide receiver debate section going through our top 36 wide receivers. We'll hit you with a deep play at both running back and wide receiver. Then we'll do our favorite streaming options at quarterback, at tight end, and at defense. Sound good? Sounds good. And needs to sound great. This sounds amazing, actually. Okay, then let's get into the fucking rankings, all right? So what we're going to do is put them on the screen, and you'll see our consensus rankings on the left. You'll see Andrew's individual, my individual, and then the biggest gaps between uh, the rankings that we have available to you right now. Now, obviously, we're only doing the top 36, but if you want all of our rankings, top 50, whatever, at every single position, half PPR, full PPR, whatever, those will be available on bdge.co to the big dog members. So you get the weekly rankings, you get the waiver wire rankings, you get the private Q&A on Saturday, you get the dynasty rankings, all that good stuff. And we've got a fantastic promo to get it to you for really, really cheap, which we'll talk about a little bit later once we get into the wide receiver stuff. But I want to start talking content here. We don't really have a significant gap anywhere inside the top 10. C-Max at one, Bijan's at two, Brees Hall's at three, Saquon four, JT five, Jameer Gibbs six, ETN seven, Kyron Williams eight. I would say, I guess maybe our first gap here is Rashad White. Consensus nine. You've got him at 12. I've got him at eight. Uh, I mean, the matchup against Washington just feels like they do have a good interior defensive line. It's like the only like good part about their defense or, yeah. and, and possibly that entire side of the ball. Uh, I just think the beginning of the season is when dudes like Rashad White who are like workhorses, will get that volume. So if you're like a Bucky believer or something, you think he's going to end up factoring into the game. I feel like that stuff kind of happens October, November, December maybe. So I feel like Rashad White's in for a very big workload off the rip. And they throw the ball to their running backs a lot. So I, I, I'd imagine they're just going to take advantage of Baker throwing the ball against this Washington defense and probably use him on dump offs and screens. So these are half PPR rankings, by the way. Again, on the site, we have full PPR available to you. Uh, but Rashad, yeah, I just I think he gets workhorse treatment out of the gate. I, I could definitely see it. I think I'm tempering my expectations a tiny bit with this Tampa Bay offense with Dave Canales now in Carolina. I don't really know what to expect out of Liam Cohen, but obviously I still think he's going to be an RB1 for us this week. I have him still in the top 12. I think he's still going to get the volume, and that's why I'm playing him. I'm interested to see how much they use White now that they have that OC change. That's the only thing that's really kind of making me temper the expectation a tiny bit, I think, with White this week. Yeah, no, it's fair. We're just we're kind of combing hairs here. They're top 12 guy for both of us. However, Devon A. Chan... After Derrick Henry at 10, spots in at number 11. I have him down at 15. You have him at 9. Yeah. Playing against Jacksonville. I ranked him outside of the top 12, outside of top 15. I guess when I look at the other options available in front of him, like I have Jacobs ahead of him, who I think is like for sure workhorse. I have Pacheco, who I think is for sure the workhorse. Like in my eyes, it's not too much against HN. I just kind of want to see the way they're utilizing him this year as opposed to last year. And I, again, like even even though he it didn't really matter how he was utilized last year, he was still fucking Amazing. all over the place. Yeah. The Jacks have a pretty good run defense. They're not a great pass defense overall, but I think the run defense is pretty good. Uh, I, I expect Mostert to have a really heavy dose of, of usage off the gate. And it's like, again, Week one and season-long rankings are very different. Like, if you're buying into HN, you're probably buying a little bit into over the course of the season, HN gets more and more work. Raheem Mostert has a long injury history, right? But, like, he can get injured in week three or seven, and you could still be right about that for season-long. But, like, week one, Mostert has to stay healthy for one game, not one full season. So, I'm like, I right. think Mostert will be really involved right off the rip. So, I just – this is one of those, like, wait and see. I want to see what HN's role is coming into the new year. Fair enough. I think this game's going to be fast-paced. I think that Jacksonville's going to have to play keep up with them. We know how fast that Miami can play and how many points they can put up in a hurry. I think HN, he's going to be a key part of this offense, and they've already kind of talked about using him a little bit more in the receiving game. If he starts getting more receptions and that he starts, you know, actually playing a little bit more downfield in the receiving game, I think we could be looking at an actual cheat code and, and true, like, RB1 overall upside at the end of the year. And I think that if that starts to happen, even a week one game against Jacksonville where – like you said, the defense is all right. It's not great. Uh, he could still definitely have a big week, and, and that's kind of just the reason why I have him here in the top 10. I think he just has more upside than some of these other guys. And you mentioned Josh Jacobs. Um, for me, I, I just have HN above Jacobs just because I think that Philly defense is legit. Yeah, I, the, the thing that does scare me with HN is like watching Miami this preseason. They were using pre-snap motion, getting the ball out really quick at a level that I, I know if they've they've used it previously and it was a big part of their offense, like – 
you know, 50, 60% of the time, it was every single play. And I'm like, man, they might just be, they might run 78 plays a, a fucking game. <laughs> and I'm like, HN could catch like five or six passes and still only be like a fraction of the offense because yeah. they run so quickly at the line of scrimmage. So that, that does scare me. Well, and, and we also know that anytime he touches the football, it could be to the house. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so maybe I feel terrible about that one. Pacheco <laughs> at 12. James Cook at 13. We've got a six-spot difference here. This is simply just, like, how involved I think Cook is going to be in that offense. Um, he played, like, 100% of the snaps with the Stars this preseason, third and longs, like, everywhere. And it's the matchup. Like, Arizona, you know, Buffalo, big favorites. Arizona's defense is one of the worst in the NFL. So I'm I'm just trying not to overthink this. Like I, I do think the gap could come down to like whether or not he scores a touchdown. But I think James Cook, we're gonna see him so involved in the passing game, I think, right away. I think, think so? that's gonna be the big difference in this year relative to last year or the second half of last year. We saw him super involved. So I wouldn't be surprised if James Cook if James Cook catches like four or five passes in this game, and that's, like, the difference to me there. Yeah, I mean, I could see it happening. I obviously have them a little bit lower. I'm kind of wait and see with this Buffalo Bills offense, I think, for the most part. I don't really know what to expect out of them, and I actually do believe that this game is going to be a lot closer than people think. I think this Arizona Cardinals offense is legit. Yeah. I don't think that that Bills defense is that good either. They've lost a lot of key pieces on it as well. Like, this could Buffalo, be— they're in Buffalo. Though. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's just, like, a tough play. Coming, like, cross-country, like, all hyped-up pieces, it's— you know, Kyler's back, but like Marv's new. You know, I, I think there's, I get what you're saying. I think over the long term, like the season, I'm, I'm with you. Like Arizona's going to be a, a nice explosive offense. I think their defense is still trash, but like Buffalo, they're going to have to figure out what they're doing on offense for sure. Like they have a lot of moving parts as well, and they're going to need to mesh. But that's the reason I almost like James Cook right now is because he's one of the constants where it's like, if we're going to get uh, consolidated for like the first month and try to figure out, like he's going to be one of our key pieces Just that we know on. we can rely on right now. Like yeah. we don't know what Keon Coleman, uh, Keon Coleman is in game time. We don't know like what Shakir's role is going to eventually be. We don't know if Samuel's even playing in week one kind of thing. Like we do know James Cook will be a big part of the offense. Fair enough. I'm even looking at my rankings right now too, because that makes sense what you're saying. Like just lean on James Cook here. I'm even just looking at it though. And I'm like, I can't move him above Pacheco for me. I can't move him above Kenneth Walker here this week. Like, like Kamara, what's the difference between him and Kamara? Except James Cook's got a much better matchup, in my opinion, and he's, I think, a better player. I'm more confident that Kamara is going to get the goal line work, whereas Josh Allen can take some of that from James Cook. I'm more confident that Alvin Counter, Kamara. Counterpoint, Taysom Hill has taken a lot of goal Fair line work enough. this preseason, and Jamal Williams is healthy. Fair I think enough. They're use we'll him. talk about Taysom yeah. Hill a little bit later, but uh, I do. Counter, I, counter I'm just point. looking at it, and I'm like, I know Alvin Kamara is going to catch. I don't know, but I feel like he will catch more footballs, I guess, than James Cook. That's the only thing. I guess maybe you could make – that's the one I could make an argument. I could move James Cook to 14, but like you said, we're kind of combing hairs there. But other than that, like, I don't feel like I can really move him much higher in my range. That's fair. I, I just think, like, James Cook, too, we underestimate how good of a runner he was last year. Like, he had a ton of games over 100 yards from scrimmage. We're like, when was the last time Alvin Kamara went over a buck? I'm, I'm seeing flashbacks. Like years ago. Of, like, uh, earlier in the summer when we were we had this James Cook argument, but we were on opposite sides. I was pro-Cook, yeah. and you were anti-Cook. Well, that was also Dynasty, too. I know, yeah. but now we're, like, on yeah. opposite sides of this thing. It's, yeah. it's just funny. He's yeah. a good player. It's, it, we can't debate that. Yeah, so, all right, we'll keep moving down. Kenneth Walker, we've got at 14 Josh Jacobs at 15 five spot difference again just opening week uh I don't think we're gonna see Marshawn Lloyd so I think we see Jacobs with just a full workload and a lot of that is like the Eagles defense I, th I think they're a little bit overhyped if we see Carter and Davis really come together this year and become like a force in the middle then they could be a defense that you don't want to start running backs against right away though like you know there are going to be Packers running backs that catch passes yeah I would say like ultimately the running backs might get five to six targets in this game I just think because Jacobs happens to be the dude that's going to get all of them like for me the floor the ceiling just goes boom with that yeah fair enough I, I think the the defense is a little bit tough this whole Brazil game in general just is bad vibes right now like dude, I don't even know what I was to gonna say like the over under is really high and I almost look back at last year like every team that played in London that traveled like right before the game and I think the teams were traveling today for the Brazil game the only team I think that played well last year was Jacksonville like one time because they stayed there for two weeks because they yeah. had back-to-back -back games the travel like fucks teams up man I, I don't like it either I well, want to just take the under on that game and not even to mention like the fact that these guys can't leave the hotel room they can't go like do anything like right. it's like not even safe for them to be there at this point like I don't know this whole thing is bad just banned vibes. Twitter there did they yeah they banned it like dude like, uh, people are not going to be able to tweet from inside the stadium and shit. It's like, yeah, like, the only thing that you can see is the national broadcast, I think. Like, yeah. you sh yeah, it's it's bad vibes in Brazil. I, I just think Josh Jacobs, like you said, he's going to get a workload. I'm 
I think I'm with you with the under on this game. I think the defense is a little bit good. I think he can fall into the end zone, and obviously that's going to give you a pretty good day in itself. But Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. I I, I guess I just have him here as more of a high-end running back, too. Yeah. for us than really anything yeah. else. I, mean, I, f- I feel really confident that he's going to score like 12 and a half, half PPR points yeah. and then like a 50-50 shot of getting into the end zone. If he gets is, into that end zone, he's an RB1. Yeah, like 20, 20 opportunities, 80 yards maybe, just because like that will happen, you know, off that. And that's where I'm like, I feel confident. Like I just kind of want him in my lineup because if not now, like when? Well, yeah, I mean, if you drafted – uh, Josh Jacobs, you're not going to bench him. Like, you have to start Josh Jacobs if you drafted him because you spent high draft capital to get him, and you likely don't have another running back that's, better than that's him. That's the other thing team. with these pieces of content. It's like we waste 20 mi- – not waste, but we talk, like, 20 minutes about, like, the top 20 backs, and it's like if you have any of these guys, they just have to go into your fucking lineup. Yeah. If you're sitting here debating between, like, a guy who we have, like, let's just say lower on the list, Zach Moss and, and Josh Jacobs, like, what are we doing here? We're just starting Josh Jacobs. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So let's keep moving down. We got Kamara. We got a, a four-spot difference there. Me, I'm just like, I've never been more out on a fucking offense than I am the Saints. Like, their offensive line is so bad. And, yeah, they can they could run it back with what they did last year and just dump off to Kamara again. But with the new offensive coordinator, I don't think – You don't like Kubiak? I do. I just think it's not going to be the same thing where we just saw Kamara catch six passes. Sure. So I think there might be a little bit of a, a difference there. So, overall, again, like you're probably getting Kamara into your lineup. I like him way more in full PPR. Counterpoint, the Carolina Panthers are – awful yeah they're bad <laughs> i just think that that whole game will be like slow paced low scoring just yeah. like it's one of those like when you have kamara it's you're waiting for the saints to like get the ball back and it's like please like get it to my guy and it's just like it never bleh. nobody's gonna want to watch this game you'll see some of the the plays on red zone but like nobody's actually watching this game unless you're gut i guess a carolina panthers <laughs> fan yeah. or you're a saints fan yeah i mean as a falcons fan i guess i want to see what happens in the south also but uh even this you won't even watch this one. one will be tough yeah. tough on the eyes yeah uh the next like 10 dudes we're really, really in sync on. We got Mixon, uh, 17, James Conner at 18, DeMont, 19, Aaron Jones, 20, Raheem Mostert, 21, Najee, 22, DeAndre Swift, 23, and Javante, 24. So those round out the RB2s pretty much for us. Yeah, Is there I anyone mean, in that gap right there that you even, like, you think there's something worth talking about? No, I mean, the the most we have a gap on anybody is two. I mean, it's it's Mostert, Najee, and, and Conner, and I feel like all of these guys are just kind of safe floor RB2s. Like, I don't feel like they have a ton of upside unless they're falling into the end zone once or twice. If they do, obviously, they're going to have a lot of upside. But I don't think any of these guys are, are world breakers here in week one. Yeah, agreed. Um, all those guys, I think you could, yeah, you can get into the back of your lineup, RB2s, flexes, whatever, whatever. You feel safe with those guys, though, right? Like, if you're plugging them in as RB2, you feel like you're going to get 10 points out of them? Yeah, to be honest with you, I think I'm a little higher on DeAndre Swift than I thought I was. Like, I, I've been someone who's kind of been off Swift yeah. for the summer, and I think even looking at it, like, opening game, Tennessee's defense is not very good. Their secondary got really good over the offseason. They, they signed a lot of good players, uh, cornerback safety, whatever. But, like, I don't know that I feel super comfortable with, with Swift, although, like, the rest of my options, it's not, it's not like it gets – super bright like past Swift, well, I, so just, I guess i just told you i put swift on my underdog pick them they have him at one and a half receptions i'm taking yeah. over on that easy i think that's pretty good they'll probably try to get him involved on like a screen yeah. right away so you'll get like half of that off the rip uh next up we got ramondre i have him 28 you got him 24 so a little bit of a gap there ramondre this is just like they're playing the Bengals. they're nine yep. point dogs right now like they're not gonna be able to establish the fucking run so it, it, it really comes down to like does he break away a big play in the passing game is if gibson is using the passing game because they're going to be trailing so much more than anticipated and this becomes a big problem for Stevenson he's he's very good in the passing game too so there's a chance that they just split third down work etc but I just think for me with Stevenson I'm not excited to throw him in my lineup like I think he doesn't have a lot of upside but like you said if they're trailing you know I do worry a little bit about Gibson I, I've drafted Gibson a lot actually in my underdog best ball drafts just mm-hmm. because I think he's going to be utilized a little bit but Stevenson catches a couple passes they get into the red zone they start giving him a couple touches to try and get one in even yeah. if it's garbage time like he could very well save his week and and top 24 isn't crazy I don't think yeah that it's just for half PPR like he's another one like Kamara where I'm not expecting a touchdown I'm not expecting a ton of carries he'll catch passes but like is that enough in half PPR to get me kind of excited we got Zamir White at 26 and then the next biggest gap Tony Pollard you have him at 30 I have him at 24 so I do have him in as my RB2 another one of these like veteran September type of you know energies where uh, throughout the preseason so far, him and Tajay Spears are splitting work, and I expect that to be the case all all season. Maybe you think Tajay Spears is more talented and he takes the job eventually. Sure, 
but I don't I don't care. It's week one. Like that's not gonna happen off the rip. Pollard will get the fifty fifty or the fifty five forty five sixty forty kind of split there. I think they'll both be using the red zone. I think they'll both be using the passing game. Uh, it's just gonna be a very spread offense, and I, I I liked what we saw from Tony Pollard in the preseason so far. I think what we saw over the second half of last year is probably more indicative of who he is, and they gave him the contract. So again, yeah. like off the rip, they're gonna try to prove that he's the right move for them and. Yeah, on the flip side, I got, like, Swift at 23, Pollard 24, very much the same, like, storyline I just gave. I like Chicago's offense more than I like Tennessee's offense, so I'll, I'll uh, yeah, lean I Swift too. there over, over Pollard. Yeah, and I, I think for me, too, it's it's also just looking at that that Tennessee Titans offense and there being a, a lot of question marks, to be honest. Like, there there's sure. not one thing I feel super confident about in that entire offense, and I, I guess I'm just projecting the workload split and and maybe not them getting off to a, a hot start here in week one. Yeah, no, that, that's super fair. I, I It's a little nerve-wracking. It, it kind of feels like Pollard's floor could be low. Like if he doesn't score a touchdown, uh, then he could end up being like, like an seven eight point points, player. Eight yeah, points, so yeah. I feel that we got Jerome Ford at twenty eight. We've got Devin Singletary at twenty nine. Chuba at thirty, and then Jalen Warren at thirty one. So obviously a huge split here. I've got him up at twenty five. You got him at thirty six. Now this is like all pretty much injury related. Like you're just gonna have to stay on top of injury reports. He seemed really optimistic over the last like couple of weeks that he's gonna be playing week one. Obviously, like players just say shit all the time. Like they're like right their Achilles and be like I'm gonna be out there next week so that's that I don't really care for but I do follow a lot of beat reporters who have been watching Jalen Warren at practice they said he looks good they say he looks springy like he's should be good to go I should probably be a little bit more we honestly should both probably be meeting a little bit more in the he middle he should be around he should be around what our consensus is like we should both have him at 31 yeah. most likely where it's like you'd probably rather not play him because my my only worry is like even if he feels great and the coaches are like yeah he looks good it's like why push him in week one when you have, like, Cordero Patterson and, like, Jalen Warren can play, like, 30% of the snaps. is why I have him where I have him. I'm playing more of that pessimistic. You're more of the optimistic. And it's like, if he does feel – let's say he feels 90%, 95%. This isn't necessarily a game where we're expecting it to be the most difficult matchup that they're going to have all year. It isn't necessarily a must-win for them either, Atlanta Falcon fan. Uh, but actually, at the end of the it day – Actually, is a must-win. For you guys? No, I'm I'm dead serious because like we play Pittsburgh and then our next two games I think are like the Chiefs and the uh, it, it's like two of the t- the hardest teams in the NFL maybe the Niners or something like that so if we lose to Pittsburgh there's like a real possibility like this new regime new money came in with Kirk that we're 0 and 3 off the rip and it's like we got problems well I don't think Pittsburgh is feeling like it's a must win Facts. for them yeah. and and that being said like if that is the case like you said why are you pushing Jalen Warren you have some other depth in this backfield that obviously Arthur Smith is comfortable with whether he should be comfortable with them or not I don't know but he is comfortable with them and we both do believe that Najee Harris is talented enough that if you give him you know 15 18 20 carries this week it's not going to matter really anyways uh so we got Brian Robinson at 32 Zach Moss at 33 Gus at 34 Chase Brown at 35 Tajay at 36 no huge differences there I kind of wish I moved Zach Moss up a little bit I wanted to talk about these guys because we both are kind of like having them in the same range of like we don't really know what's going to happen here yeah I think Zach Moss is a better inside runner than Chase Brown is and I think in games where like the game script is going to be predictable it's going to move towards Zach Moss and like again as nine point favorites against the Pats I would put him at a pretty good chance of scoring a touchdown in this one and yep. we'll obviously talk about the receivers, but like Jamar Chase, it's looking like very real that he could miss week one, which would obviously probably be more on the running backs here. So I, I think Zach Moss have him at 31, but like I would be I would feel really good about having him in my in my flex for this one. He's kind of like Ramondre too, where he's proven to be a good pass catcher. So you can use him on early downs as a pass catcher. You can keep him in on third downs if you want to. You can use him in the screen game on second down, whatever. So I think Zach Moss is is someone that I would like highlight as probably should be a little bit higher. Yeah, I mean, I, w- I was recording this video actually for my channel last night, and I was talking a little bit about this game in particular, and I was saying that, uh, you know, the Bengals, I would not be surprised if the majority of the second half, they're just grinding out the clock. Yeah. Like, that's very much, this could be the blowout game of the weekend, and it, if that's the case, like you said, Zach Moss is probably too low in both of our rankings because if they are going to give him a full workload in the second half, if he is going to fall into the end zone, He's probably going to outproduce a lot of the guys that we have above. Yeah, I, w- I would also point out with like the Patriots defense, they were great last year. They obviously lose Bill Belichick, which is going to be a blow to it. Their passing defense, th- this could end up being a funnel type of defense 
where they're really good in the pass and shakier through the run because they obviously lose Judon, who's a pass rusher, yeah. but still on the D-line. Barmore's not Christian healthy. Barmore, yeah, he's dealing with blood clots, et cetera. Yep. He's going to be out for the foreseeable future. So their d line's going to be a lot shakier than it was just like a month ago. So just keep that in mind. And as a team that's probably going to be down often – with a weaker defensive line, like that is just the that's like the formula for opposing running backs to just fucking chew on the bone. There. Little little side note here: How quickly do you think New England switches to Drake May? Three four weeks? Yeah, I would say we see him like at the latest the first week of October. They start own three own four and they're going to May right away. Yeah, probably. I guess they, maybe they're they need to see what the O line looks like. If Brissett is back there getting clobbered like like Sam Howell last year, taking you like think five six sacks a game, I don't. I feel like they're not going to want to. You think they're protecting May? They're not doing it because they don't think he's ready. Yeah, I, I think they're going into it with the same attitude that like every team tries to when they're like, let's sit our rookie quarterback. But like, yeah. no bad team ever has the luxury of actually doing that. I think anybody who watched the preseason saw that Jacoby Brissett is not a good quarterback. Like, he was not making the right plays. Like, yeah. Drake May outperformed. Sure, him in Jacoby's preseason. like always just been the product of the offense around him. If he's got a good line, he's got some good weapons. Like, he'll be fine for you. Yeah. Anyways, um, I, just I, I still have questions about Drake May for sure. I don't know. Maybe maybe the move is just getting him out there and seeing what comes of it and if he's if he's got real like upside to bring to this offense. I would feel better about a lot of the New England options if May was under center. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. The, I mean, this offense will be one of the most boring offenses in the NFL under Brissett. For, for sure. sure. All right, so those are the top 36 running back rankings. Each week, we're going to come to you with one deeper-ish cut guy ranked outside of the top 40 uh, according to ECR that we think are playable that we think uh, it's got some upside that we think you know you could get into your line if you could talk yourself into flexing those guys so who you got yeah somebody we didn't talk about in this video but I feel like is a good offense is going to be Dallas and I think we can play Ezekiel Elliott this week I know that this matchup against Cleveland is a little bit tougher you obviously have Miles Garrett and some of these other guys on the defensive line but they're going to have some goal line opportunities and I feel like Zeke profiles as the goal line back in this offense better than what Rico Dowdle does mm -hmm. and so if anybody in this offense in the running back room is going to fall into the end zone it's probably going to be Ezekiel Elliott and they're probably going to have what two three touchdown opportunities here in this game at least they should be if they're going to continue to be this good I don't know uh, I, I just feel like obviously we're talking about a deep cut you could probably flex Zeke and if you do flex him you're looking at a guy that you're hoping gets into the end zone yeah the matchup for me is a little bit too scary I think is here because it? it's like they can have a lot of scoring opportunities but if those scoring opportunities aren't from like the one or two yard line it feels like maybe unattainable for Zeke you think so I mean he's not scoring from like 16 out or anything like that I don't I don't think within the 10 maybe I don't know. I don't know if he's got that spring like that. I, I think he'll be I a, guess a we'll goal see. line vulture where, like, when they play against fucking New York or they – I guess it's a bad example of Dexter Lawrence in the middle. But when they play against, like, really bad teams, that's when I'm like, Carolina. Right, <laughs> yeah, like, Zeke's going to start eating there. But yeah. against, like, good defenses, I question if Zeke has the talent to be, like, a good enough player in your fantasy lineup. I just – I don't – see a major difference between a guy like Zeke and a guy like Gus Edwards, who we have at 34. Like, they're kind of the same plays here. I just feel like Zeke is probably in the better offense. For sure. I, I would agree with that. I think, for me, it was way more matchup-based because Gus goes against, you know, Vegas. I'm like, okay, probably. Fair. Their defense looked good down the stretch last year under Pierce. No, that's, that's super fair. And and they brought in Christian Wilkins, so maybe yeah. I'm, like, overestimating that. But, yeah, we'll, but yeah, that's we'll my, see. That's my deep play. We'll see. It's it's a deep play, so. These are deep fucking plays. Khalil Herbert, another deep play. He's the RB48 on the week. They're playing against Tennessee. You know, I kind of talked about DeAndre Swift. Tennessee's run defense is extremely middle of the pack, if not below average. Uh, I also think, like, what we saw this preseason, they want Herbert to be involved. He's clearly the RB2. Like, Roshan Johnson has shown us absolutely nothing. I think people are still, like, holding on for hope there, which I don't think we're ever going to see come to fruition. So, I think it's going to be a clear committee between Swift and Herbert. And Chicago's, like, four, four-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. So, yeah. I don't think there will be... Not that I think they're going to dominate and, like, start to go to the run so heavily because, you know, they're up so big, but more so to the fact that Herbert's a dude who could get game script. If you're down big, like if they're playing the Chiefs or some shit, Herbert's probably not on the field at all. But in a game where they're four-point favorites, at worst, you know, they're down a field goal sometimes. Like, Herbert doesn't get phased out of the game. So I think there's a chance when they got on the goal line, Herbert's the back and not DeAndre Swift. I think yeah. there's a chance that Herbert has 12 carries in this game. Like, I, I, I like Herbert. He's all the way down there, and I think – you know, you can you if you're desperate, you're in a deeper league. I, I like him this year. Yeah, I think if week. they get up too, you know, rest Swift a little bit. You don't gotta you know give him a yeah. heavy workload right away if you're already winning. Yes, sir. Before we move on to the wide receivers, one thing we did not mention with any of the running backs, Saquon, JT, is the the chance that they get vultured on the goal line. We're just kind of throwing them in. 
you're worried about that, Underdog Fantasy released this promo this week that they're going to be running all year called Vulture Protection, which is super dope. Basically, if you're on the app, if you're on Underdog, if you take Saquon higher than 0.5 touchdowns, Jonathan Taylor higher than 0.5 touchdowns, and they get vultured on the goal line, that square of the slip gets voided. Like, obviously, if you miss your other picks, then then the entire slip is going to miss. But if you have Saquon and Jalen Hurts scores from the one-yard line, you will get refunded for the Saquon pick you have. So this is a brand-new promo that they're running, Vulture Protection, which is dope. And we'll put the list of running backs that you could take for week one. It's huge. It's pretty much every starting running back in the NFL. So if any of them gets vultured by a backup running back, by a quarterback or whatever, your slip will be voided. You will not lose. So shout-out to Underdog Fantasy for that. If you're new to the platform and you use code BDGE, you are going to get a deposit bonus on the platform. We are also running a promo. This is what I was saying to wait for, where you will get access to our Big Dog membership for the entire year by using our promo code when you deposit just $10 on there, right? So deposit bonus, you'll get a Travis Kelsey free square of 0.5 yards for tomorrow night's game. You'll get some vulture protection. You'll get it all, all right? Big Dog membership for the entire NFL season just by downloading Underdog Fantasy using our code BDGE. Sounds like a whole lot of free to me. For real. There's a whole lot of promos. Underdog wants to run promos. We're fucking <laughs> running promos, too. We ain't fucking Sounds leaving. like the best $10 you ever spent. All right. So let's talk about receivers. This is a colorful chart here. We've got yeah. some differences of opinions. Now, we can kind of get through the top. We can get through the top 10, I think, without there being a very large discrepancy here. And maybe we want to talk about the Rams-Detroit game or something like that. You brought it up a little pre-show. Yeah. But we'll run through the first 10 quickly. We got Tyree Kill as the one, Amon Ra is the two, Jefferson as the three, CD as the four, A.J. Brown as the five, Jamar Chase six, Puka seven, Garrett Wilson eight, Mike Evans nine, Cooper Cup ten. Let's actually circle back because we do have some players to Let's talk about Let's circle here. back, yeah. Yeah, we got C.D. Lamb who ended his holdout. We have him consensus four. I mean, on a normal given week, it is a tough matchup against Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, but I think on a normal given week, it's going to be him and Tyree Hill probably as the one and two, no matter what. Like, I don't know that matchups depend on it. I'm a little bit skeptical of the dudes who hold out for the entire summer and like the likelihood of them, you know, being a hundred percent pulling a hammy or something, you know, the hold out yeah. hammy, the hold out hammy could be real here. It's real. Yeah. So like, you know, conditioning could be real here, whether or not you get injured early on, like you see a lot of players in the summer suffer hamstrings in July and August because once you ramp up to full speed, that is when the majority of muscle strains happen. Once you're like eight weeks, 10 weeks into the season, you don't see a ton of like hamstring pulls. The number of them gets less and less because you're well conditioned. So if you're just getting back into shape, like obviously CD Lamb, I'm sure has been working out. But there's game speed and like practice speed are two different, two different sure. things, right? So like with CD, I factor that into it a little bit which I also do with Jamar Chase. Obviously, if Jamar Chase doesn't play, he's completely coming off the board for us. Yeah. But that's that's a weird situation, too. So I will say I docked both of them just like one or two ranking spots, probably, just off the fact that first week, like we see players kind of start a little bit slow when they hold out. Fair enough. I, I don't even know if I docked Lamb at all for the the holdout. Just more I just think based. that Jefferson is going to feast against this Giants defense. This Giants defense is not that good. There's not a corner on this defense. Not that defense. good. That's like generous. Their cornerbacks and their safeties are horrible. <laughs> I was going to say, there's not a corner yeah. on this defense that can even be in the same realm as yeah, Jefferson. Yeah, no. like, Banks is cool, but he's like... He's he's going to get double-digit targets. He's going to... It's going to be a... It's going to be a good day for Jefferson. And then I just think that the matchups and the players of Tyreek Hill and Amon Ra, they're just that good this week that CeeDee Lamb just found himself in four. It wasn't even like a, a holdout knock for me. Yeah, and then we both have Puka and Cooper Cup ranked high. I have Puka at seven. You have him at eight. I have Cup at nine. You have him at 13. Yep, we have both of these guys basically being wide receiver ones this Yeah, week. I mean, we're expecting hopefully a shootout in Detroit. Uh, this Detroit is the game versus the Rams. I am the most excited to watch this weekend. Yeah, this is a great fucking game. A playoff matchup, playoff rematch, I should say. Yep. Um, I will say the only thing that kind of scares me is if, like, Detroit decides to just, like, impose their will and they're just like, our, our, yeah, like, our entire game plan is going to be just ground and pound and give David Montgomery 20 carries, Jameer Gibbs 16 carries, and just, like, clock just drips away. I'm also very excited about it because did you watch Receiver on Netflix? Mm-hmm. 
the whole golf Detroit yeah. Rams narrative, like this whole thing was painted out to be, and it's just like we get the rematch. This is this is everything that we want. It's also the highest projected game total of the weekend. Yeah. So Vegas is expecting them to score the most points. There should be a plenty of fantasy football points, and I think we've already seen guys like Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua when they're on the field together. They work well together. They both can be productive at the same time. I don't think that there's really anything to worry about with these guys. I think the Detroit defense – will be a defense that by the end of the year we're scared of. Yes. But it's going to take a minute to mesh. Uh, I think DJ Reader is probably going to miss week one. And and the things that we're excited about in the secondary, like they get Brian Branch back, who's going to be a stud. Uh, they added Terry two Arnold. rookies, Terry Arnold and Ennis Rakestraw. They brought in Carlton Davis. Those pieces are going to take a minute to, to mesh. Yeah. So, like, the first month, we might not see a huge improvement on the defensive side of the ball. But, like, second half of the year, that's when coaches like Dan Campbell, like, get that shit together. And that's when they're, they'll are they start to, like, really mesh. So, I'm not, like, Puka and Cooper Cup are going to eat these rookies alive. Yeah. So, we can keep moving down. Garrett Mont- Wilson? We have a three-spot difference on Garrett. Yeah, three-spot difference. I, I just think San Francisco is a little bit better of a run defense than they are a, a pass defense. And I think that, you know, what they've wanted to do in New York is get Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers to feed Garrett Wilson the football. We don't even know if Mike Williams is going to be 100%, you know, in this game or anything like that. And so with that being said, I think Garrett Wilson is going to see a ton of targets. He probably finds himself in the end zone. I mean, if they're going to score, they're going to have to pass the football to him as well. Maybe it's just Brees Hall. But other than that, I, th- I think he is one of the few wide receivers that we can guarantee is going to get double-digit targets this weekend. Yeah, I mean, got him at 10, obviously starting him. I, I just yeah. think, like, I look at the matchups for the guys. I have Evans at 8 against Washington. It was fucking Fair. beautiful. Cooper Cup, yep. Detroit, like we already said. So, Fair. like, w- if Garrett Wilson ended up leading the NFL in targets this week, wouldn't be surprised. But also, the thing about playing against San Francisco is, while their pass defense not, might not be great, it's like their offense – dictates games usually fair and you know control that pace of they control the pace they take so much time like they let their defense rest all the time and that's like what i think they it's why they're so dominant on both sides of the ball because they work off of each other so well so you know you're so good on offense you're going to score a ton of points um and maybe the jets defense is good enough to overcome that but like if they get into their rhythm then it puts a lot of pressure on on the jets to start like forcing things and we also don't know what roger's gonna look like like we haven't actually seen him play football in two years now so it's possible that he's, you know, just lost a little bit of a step there. Fair enough. Uh, speaking of Rodgers, his old, his old alpha, Devontae Adams, you got him at nine. I got him at 16. This is more just like just the Raiders offense, man. I just it, – it last year it was like you got a great Adams or you got a shit Adams, and I'm like I, I have enough guys in my rankings that I feel confident enough about that we're not going to get like a Jekyll and Hyde type of performance out of them that I would rather just wait and see on this. I am buying into narrative a little bit here. Also, a little bit of coach speak. They're going to want to get Devontae Adams involved. Like, that's going to be one of the top priorities for them in this offense. And with that being said, the Chargers, we don't really know what this team is going to look like offensively. But defensively, they're not going to be that good on the defensive side of the football. The secondary is a little bit suspect. We know that Devontae Adams has a history of torching these guys. Like, he always goes off against them. Maybe I'm buying into narrative a little bit too much, but I would not be surprised if Devontae Adams has a big week this week. And and uh, obviously, I have him as a wide receiver one for us in fantasy. Yeah. I, I, the, the narrative about him getting fed makes sense. Like, no no Josh Jacobs. The, in, internally, they got to be like, we got to get this guy. Like, the first half of the year needs to be the Adam show because he's going to request a trade if yeah. we don't get shit going. So, I could yeah. definitely see that. Uh, I guess one of my concerns is just, like, the slow pace of this game where it's like... Run, run, run. It's just like, what, yeah, they're going to be battling for, like, who can have more carries in the backfield. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this is going to be such but a boring... We don't game. even have Zamir high in our rankings either, and we Facts. and we don't have Gus. And it's going to be a boring game, but I do have Adams high, I guess. It's so. just a weird game. This is one of those games where we're going to figure out so much right away. It's like we just try to predict shit all offseason, and then, like, week one hits, and then we'll know... Dobbins, Edwards, Kamani Vidal. We'll know the Zamir White split. We'll know if they're going pass heavy or yeah. just like super run heavy in, in Las Vegas. My brother's a big Raiders fan, and and if you ask him, he says that Adams is going to feast. So I sure. I don't know. Sure, every Raiders fan thinks that yeah, you know whatever. But I mean, he, he should. But I just like I, I don't really trust it. We've got Nico at twelve. We've got Jalen Waddle at thirteen. Six spot difference. Uh, I just think Miami through the air is going to torch. Jackson, uh, Jacksonville. They got like a new defense, a new system. I think they're like, I think they've been a little bit in shambles most of the off season. I feel like they're going to get a, off to a very slow start. So in this for me is a little bit of a. I'm bumping him down just a few spots. I think because of that undisclosed leg injury that he's been dealing with. Does yeah, that worry you fair. at all? 
Dude, I don't know. I don't know what to think about. We don't know what it injuries. is. Yeah, that that's fair. It probably should worry me more than it does. But this is one of those things. Like we're filming this on Wednesday. Games are on Sunday. So if he gets full practices today, Wednesday, like we film it Wednesday morning, and most of these rankings videos will be filmed Wednesday morning. It's like nine a.m., ten a.m. right now. Uh, so we'll get practice reports in about two hours, and then obviously tomorrow's practice report is going to be important. Friday right. is going to be important. So we'll have a lot more information by then. Obviously. You know, if you are a Big Dog member and you're following our rankings, we, we will update them in real time as injury reports come out. So that's exactly. something that we'll, we'll keep a strong eye on. For now, it doesn't seem like anything out of camp is, like, overly concerning with him. So I'm kind of going to ride that energy. Fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and, and obviously you're, we're still doing start-sit streams and stuff this year too, right? Yeah. Yeah, so stay tuned for that right, too. Like, Saturday. as this all updates, like, that'll happen. There'll be some on, on this channel. There'll be some on my channel. The, everything. But – yeah, just, this is going to adapt over time, but like you said, we did it on Wednesday. I'm just bumping him down a tiny bit because of that injury right now. I just don't know enough about it to feel like super confident in him as a wide receiver one this week. No, that, that's fair. Uh, you got Marvin Harrison as a wide receiver one, though. Hell yeah. Yeah, I got him down at 18. Again, it's just like the, the travel all the way to Buffalo, even if their team is not like top-heavy talent defensively like they used to be. I still think that's a really tough environment to play in, and I think Buffalo is going to just control the clock and control – the game for the most part. Yeah, I mean, look, I've already told you I feel good about this Cardinals offense. I think they're going to be much, much Mc, improved. McBride going to feast without Milano. I think that this game is going to be one of the most exciting of the weekend. I already talked to you about how much I think that that Bills defense is kind of in shambles. We've already talked about it. It's just such a different defense than they've had in years past. And, uh, look, Marvin Harrison was brought in to be the alpha number one wide receiver. I think he's going to show it very quickly. He should have a ton of targets as well. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets into the end zone. Like, this is going to be the Kyler Murray, Marvin Harrison, Trey McBride show here yeah. in Arizona. I think Marv will be good. I don't know. There, there's just so much of me that's like, he'll probably go like six for 70. I'm like, I'm not, I don't are like you, that in half PBR. Are you just pulling him down because he's a rookie? Some people don't like to rush the rookie out there. Uh, I have no problem getting him in my lineup again. If, if this game was like, if they were like at home against the Raiders, I'd probably have him like top 10. Fair. But again, traveling all the way to Buffalo for your first week in that type of environment is going to be tough. Fair enough. Uh, let's keep let's keep moving down the list. We got DJ Moore at 15, Debo at 16, Drake London. Got a little bit of a discrepancy here. Just you, a tiny one. You got him top 12. I've got him down at 25, <laughs> which, all right. Looking looking at it, maybe there is a little bit of... Uh, 25 is a little crazy. Maybe 12 is crazy too, but 25 might be a little crazy. 25 is crazy. All right, so let me try to explain myself. All right. You're playing Christian Kirk over Drake London right now? That's what you have in your rankings. I feel, yeah, I feel pretty good about Christian Kirk against Miami. Like, that's, they're going to have to pass the ball a lot. Uh, Drake London, so here's the thing. Like, Pittsburgh's defense is so good, and I think we probably forgot a little bit about it last year because of injuries to Cameron Hayward, et cetera. Uh, Joey Porter Jr., like, became a really good cornerback in Pittsburgh. This game, I think, is is going to be really slow-paced. I know everyone thinks that, like... That's the only worry that I have with my ranking is the pace of play of this game. Yeah, like, I, I, I get the narrative, like, oh, Raheem Morris, like, comes from the fucking McVay, whatever. He was yeah. in the Rams, and it's going to be such a fast pace. I just don't think Atlanta's going to be that fast-paced of an offense. Like, what's more likely is them running their offense through B. John Robinson the 23-year-old top 10 pick, or a 36-year-old quarterback coming off an Achilles tear. Like, I get it. Like, Kirk will be a huge improvement to this offense. I just get a little bit nervous. Like, when you have a defense as good as Pittsburgh, and they look, and they're like, okay, what do we have to do to stop this passing game? It's like, cover London. That's really all, all yeah. we have to do here. So, this is one of those, I, I, I want to see the offense together. I also think, like, there are so many moving parts here. New coach, new scheme, new quarterback. This might take a month to, to mesh, right? And I, I do say, like, it is a win-now game for sure for the yeah. Falcons because their next couple matchups are really tough. But, like, this just right off the rip being exactly what everybody thinks they're going to be on paper is, like, probably unlikely. Fair enough. I, I think you're playing a little bit of a pessimistic approach, and, and that's you, fine. You, you I'm definitely flag-planting a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I, I've talked very highly about Drake Lennon all offseason. In fact, uh... I kind of made him a my guy for me at the wide receiver position where, like, he's just a guy that I wanted on any team that I could get him on. You're starting London over Cup. I am starting London over Cup. A and I think it's just when it gets down to it, I, I know that there's a lot of moving parts, and I know that the pace of play could be a little bit slower. So, in reality, you know, maybe I do need to pull him down 14, 15 range, maybe. But just off the rip, how many 
like how many yards do you think Kirk Cousins will pass for against the Steelers? I haven't even looked at the line at all. I'm mm. I'm just curious because I'm thinking about it. I'm like, I don't think that number is going to be very high. I bet it's over 250, somewhere between 250 and 300. Really? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. He's not that. W- it won't be that high on on underdog, but we'll see. Take the higher on it on underdog. Two thirty nine. I bet it's a 250 plus. 32 and a half passing attempts. Yeah, like, let me see, let me see what Drake London's lines are. This is the other great thing about like underdog and using these types of apps is they give you they give you a bit of a reality check on like Projection. what players' lines are. Yeah. They've got them up at 60 and a half receiving yards, which is that's I, it doesn't sound high, I know, but like they're they're trying to get the money even on both sides. I think that that's that's pretty high for a week it's, one line. He should have a pretty good game. And and one thing that I found interesting this offseason when I was doing my research on Drake London was that I was kind of digging into Kirk Cousins and Kirk Cousins historically just hyper targets his wide receiver one. Like yeah. he tends to give them on average over 120 plus targets per year to the wide receiver one in his offenses. So if Drake London is seeing that type of target volume in games last year where London was getting eight or more targets, he averaged like 16 fantasy points per game. Yeah. So, you know, putting him in that range, that would have put him as like the wide receiver 11 on the year. I, I know that's kind of more of a yearly projection than it is a week one projection. But if you can project that kind of volume on a week by week basis, he's going to finish pretty high. I just think it's going to come down to whether or not he gets in the end zone. He obviously has the build where you're going to look for him in the red zone. But other than that, I, I don't know. I, I think you're right. This pace it's, of play it's, is it's what just, worries it's me. It's just the matchup, yeah. This won't be like, listen, if Atlanta has a good matchup like next week, Drake London, I, I'll have no problem putting him in like top 12, top 15. I'll pull him down three spots if you pull him up three spots. Let me see who I have above <laughs> him before I shake that hand. I, I could I could, I could, could do that for you. All right, cool. I could do that for All you. Right. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just feel like this is going to be... This could be a low-scoring game here where it's yeah. like it's a, just sloppy on both That's offenses. the only thing that I – when I was doing this, I was like, it could be slow. Yeah. It could be slow. And, and then moving to the next player, Chris Olave, we have a nine-spot difference. I'm way lower on him as well. Again, I, I get the, the – the hypothetical upside or the hypothetical like love for Alave, it kind of just feels like he's been the same player since he's come into the league each year. Yes. Um, so if you're banking on like the huge change in coordinator being like the difference, which could be the case again, it's just like the Panthers are, this could be a really slow game as well. It could be and a very low scoring game. I also could see this being a game where early on Chris Alave catches, you know, three, four, five passes and one of them's a big play touchdown. And then it's like, Forget about it the rest of the evening. Yeah, I, I could see that as well, getting them involved. They're, the over-under for this game is 42 points. so It's it's kinda, not the lowest of the weekend, but it's towards the bottom. It's like middle-ish of the pack, yeah. These are they're, the higher over-unders. Like last year, it was almost like if you got to like 44 or 45, you were like considered a high over-under. And, and we and got like 49s and 51s, I f- think. 47 for Baltimore, KC, 48.5 for Green Bay, Philly, 48 for Arizona, Buffalo, 45 for Tennessee Bears. 49 for Texans. I might just rip the unders on most of Isn't uh, Rams, Detroit, isn't that one 51? 51. Yes, dude. Yeah, they're but Jags, Dolphins is 49, which is another reason I kind of like Kirk and, and Jacksonville there. Yeah, um, I, I don't mind actually playing the, the Jags wide receivers this week because they should have to play keep up. Yeah, I kind of like, uh, I wonder how much like the kickoff actually affects this. Interesting. Because I didn't they'll probably that. start the ball like a good, on average, maybe like, five to ten yards closer to the field goal range, right? Over the course of the game, yeah. I wonder how much that actually adds up in, like... Yeah. I mean, if it's one field goal game, that's the difference between games being 44 and 47 on over-under, right? It's a touchdown. We're talking about that's why you're in the 50s. Yeah. So Interesting. Um, maybe, yeah. We'll see how that plays out. That. Uh, Chris Olave, we've got Devontae Smith at 19. Rashi Rice, we have a huge difference here. you got him at 27. I've got him up at 14. Uh, yeah. I've been, obviously, really high on Rashi Rice over the last, like, month of the season or so. He just felt like the easiest fourth, fifth round pick in all your redraft leagues. With Rashi Rice... Uh, I'm just assuming it's obviously super tough matchup against Baltimore, but yeah. Vegas again is expecting a pretty high scoring game there. I think I think I just said the over under was 47. Yep. No Hollywood Brown most likely. Um, so he's I just not, I think he was ruled out this morning. Okay, so I he's going to be so. out for that one. Uh, Rachi, yeah, I, I just I just looked in our ESPN league. He had an O and he's okay, on my team. Yeah, so. he's almost definitely out yeah. then. Um, Rachi, yeah, I just think he's going to be so involved in this in this passing game and they and and their defense took some hits to the uh, yeah. to the defense. The Baltimore's lost some players this offseason. I'm I'm just like kind of sticking where I was during draft season. Fair enough. I, I think there was a point in draft season where Rashi Rice got overvalued. There was a point there where he was like a third round pick and I thought that was ridiculous. I um, actually had no problem. When he was going like end of the third where like you could choose between him and like Michael Pittman, I was like I'm fine with that. Dude, I remember there was a stream that we did uh, a while back and I got Rashi in like the eighth or ninth round and you and Adam grilled the shit out of me telling me how bad of a pick that was because I took Rashi Rice. Uh, 
Was that Dynasty? No, it was a best ball. Okay. I How think you guys were worried about a suspension, and I told you, because yeah. uh, you guys said, what's the, you know, what's your percentage of chance on, on the games being, you know, over on Yeah, I mean, my, my thing was, like, every day we got closer to the season, obviously, Rashi Rice yeah. became uh, better. And obviously, looking obviously, back now, it was a really looking sharp pick. back, that was yeah. a good pick. But, yeah. It, yeah, at the time, there was a lot of, uh, I got a lot of heat from you guys for the uh, Rashi Rice pick. Now, now you're looking and smart I, as fuck. I just thought it was funny as now the season got closer. Now you don't even want to rank closer. him as a fucking wide receiver, too. I know. Now look at me. Makes me sick. No, I, I just think, again, for me, it's a little bit of the matchup. I also am I'm not going to be surprised if this game does kind of trend towards the under. A little bit more competitive. I, I agree. I agree. Like um, that, that feels like really high. Yeah, a little bit more defenses. competitive. I think both of these teams could probably actually lean on their run game a little bit more here in week one. Agreed. Like I know Casey's Henry. like supposedly going to look like a completely new offense, but right now, with Hollywood out, like legit the only new thing from last year is worthy. Yeah, and I don't know. It, it feels like I, I should temper the expectations a little bit for Rice. Now, obviously – he has some big playability as well, but I don't necessarily feel like he's going to be like this safe play for me. In fact, I labeled him uh, in my video for the wide receivers. I labeled him as a risky wide receiver three play. Like if you want to play him as a wide receiver three, actually, no, I, I, it was a high end wide receiver three. Like if you want to play him as a wide receiver three, fine. I don't know if I'm comfortable enough throwing him in as the wide receiver two for my team, though. Okay, We'll see. It'll be exciting. I just think he'll be like a safety blanket for Mahomes on every non Kelsey throw. Uh, let's keep moving down. We got Malik at 21, Ayuk at 22. Then we've got a few difference makers here. DK at 23, seven spot difference. Pittman at 24, 10 spot difference. So DK for me, they're playing. They're playing against Denver. Yep. And legit, like Denver's only certain. He's like the only real. Do you know him and Sauce are the same age? That blew my fucking mind. For some Why? reason, I thought Sertain was like 27. Oh, just because he got in, he didn't he get into the league a year or two earlier. Probably. Yeah. I just it, it it just surprised the shit out yeah. of me. I did, I didn't realize he was as the. Because sauce, it feels like every time some people talk about sauce, it feels like he's just like twenty two years old yeah. every all the time. You know, because like, his ass is on Twitch and stuff like right, that. Right, right. He's time. so young. Like, Sertan, I just feel like he's like a, a seasoned vet at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, but DK, I kind of just feel like they got nothing going on Denver's defense except for Patrick Sertan. It's just like Sertan, DK. Yeah. Just figure it out. Legitimately, you know, something to worry about. But I think that DK is a monster to cover anyway. So even guys like Sertain, they're going to struggle. I think they're going to try and find uh, DK often in this offense. We've seen how Ryan Grubb kind of likes to use the wide receivers. We've seen uh, – we're expecting this to be an improved wide receiver room that, that's uh, the thing. and it's a like, passing offense here in it's Seattle. Like you don't, there's no reason to force it to DK if you have, like, JSN against some, like, shitty Fair. fucking safety. What do you think about the uh, – the chance that Tyler Lockett's not 100% in this game. Yeah, I, that was uh, when we talk about, like, deeper cuts at wide receiver. You know, I'll get into JSN a little bit more. Um, that was one of my reasons. I'm like, DK, Sertan, Lockett, you know, likely trending towards playing. playing. But, like, could Maybe be less than 100%, know. you know? Like, yeah. that's why I'm kind of, like, leaning towards those guys yeah. for JSN over – Lockett. So I think there's maybe something there. I think you dock him like a little bit, but it's not like anyone is really too excited about so, Lockett. So you're viewing more so DK kind of as like a wide receiver three this week, and I'm, I'm viewing him more as like a wide receiver two. Yeah, it feels weird to put him as a wide receiver three. I think I'd like to have him more as like a high-end wide receiver two, but when I look at the other guys, like... It's hard to... Yeah, like, I just think there's better options in that passing offense that will fair enough. kind of break out a little bit. Pittman, 10-spot difference. For me, it's like Houston's... If they decide to stick Stingley on him, be a problem like Anthony Richardson I still think we need to see him prove that he's a good passer we definitely need to see him prove it but I also think that the Colts could be playing keep up with this Houston Texans offense could which be. means that for the majority of this game maybe even through four quarters they're trying to pass this football and I think about obviously Josh Downs not going to be healthy yeah. uh, Adonai Mitchell a rookie are they going to lean on him that heavy in week one probably not just feed the guy that you already know is there even if he is covered by certain I mean uh that's fair I'm probably Stingley, a little bit too low on him. probably just got to give Pittman some some volume here in week one yeah he, he, yeah he'll probably get there via volume I guess m my in my eyes I was like ah he's I don't, I don't really see him scoring a touchdown but I guess does it really matter if he's going to get 10 11 targets this Texans team is going to play fast, and, and Indy already plays fast under Steichen. Yeah. They're going to have to play keep up. Yeah, that's fair. All right, so we got Mark Cooper at 25, Terry at 26, uh, T. Higgins at 27. So we've got a 10-spot difference here. This is where – I'm not going to say I factored in Jamar Chase being out. Obviously, if Jamar Chase is out, you move T. Higgins up pretty dramatically. I, I have already said that if Jamar Chase is out, T. Higgins is a top 12 play for me this week. Okay. 
I don't know that I would go that far only because they're, I think their passing offense becomes like super one dimensional where it's like if a passing defense zones in on Jamar Chase, he could beat that. Is like T Higgins a world beater where he could beat defensive schemes against him? That's kind of my question. I'm almost like I'd rather Jamar Chase play and like him have to deal with Christian Gonzalez and have T Higgins do his own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I like T if, if Jamar Chase plays. If he doesn't play, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, this. Ranking is assuming that Chase is on the field. Obviously, we don't know if that is going to be the case yet, but uh, the reason why I have him here at 29 is because we've already talked about it. Second half could not even be a passing game for this sure. Bengals offense, and yeah. if he doesn't score a big play touchdown in the first half, we could be just looking at one of those like six, seven-point weeks for T. Higgins. No, that's, that's super fair. Uh, we got Diggs at 28, Christian Kirk at 29. So those are our last big differences. differences. And then Deontay Johnson's also a six-spot difference down there at 36. So yeah. – yeah, with, with Diggs, again, I kind of want to see how this shakes out before I just, like, go all in and, and start him as a an every week starter for sure. Uh, with Kirk, as I said, like, Kirk, I think, is the number one option in this Jacksonville offense in a game that's supposed to score 50 points. So mm-hmm. I already know that him and T-Law have chemistry. So week one, where you're getting all these new parts kind of involved, like, who's he going to lean back on? Probably Kirk. Uh, and Deontay Johnson, I just, like, don't. I just he just hasn't just been my don't guy. like him. Yeah, yeah. I just like don't want to invest in this Carolina passing offense. Fair enough. I think for me, just looking at Diggs, like I think they brought him over here to utilize him in Week One. That's the best place to get a sure. you know chance to get your new guy the ball. Um, not obviously valuing him as anything other than a wide receiver too, but I feel like that's pretty safe in a game that should score a lot of points. Christian Kirk. To me, the only thing that I kind of want to pump my brakes with Christian Kirk is last year he did, you know, perform fairly well for our fantasy football teams when he was on the field. Um, They've added a couple new pieces. You have, uh, it feels like to me, almost like one too many mouths that you want to get the football. And if that is the case, it could be a little bit inconsistent for some of these uh, Jacksonville wide receivers. I do think that Kirk is probably the number one wide receiver as far as first look goes. But Brian Thomas Jr. there, Gabe Davis there, I wouldn't be you know, surprised if the ball gets distributed a little bit more. And so I'm more so looking at Kirk as a wide receiver three this week. And then for Deontay Johnson, I just have him as 33. Uh, it's mainly going to be just because of the volume for me. I think that sure. they're going to feed him in week one. They brought him over, kind of the same narrative that I just said for Stephon Diggs. You got the new weapon. Get him the football. And in a game. so many six or 50 weeks in Deontay Johnson's future. Oh, for sure. And it, it also doesn't, you know, help that he's going to be playing against Lattimore, who is a very good corner as right. well. So, um you know, not anybody I'm very excited to play, probably more so a guy that I'm just closing my eyes and putting him in my flex and hoping that I get, you know, 10 catches or, I mean, not 10 catches, 10 targets yeah. and Nothing hoping that something so happens. Go out there and like just score two touchdowns and flip the narrative completely on its fucking head. Yeah. The guy who never scores and now he's like a huge red zone target for them. Yeah. yeah that would <laughs> be crazy. But right, th- so that's kind of the, the arguments for those guys. Yeah. So after Kirk at 29, we got Fla- Zay Flowers at 30, Pickens at 31, uh, Tank Dell at 32, Chris Godwin at 33, Ridley at 34, Jaden Reed at 35, Deontay Johnson at 36. Moving to our deeper cuts. As I already explained, um, I took JSN. I know he's not like super deep of a cut here, but a lot of you guys are probably, de- you know, deciding whether or not to throw him into your flex spot. He is the 41st ranked wide receiver per ECR. So he does qualify for our outside top 40. As I said, you know, going against Denver, they're a bad defense overall, but Sertan, I think will, for the most part, he'll stay on the outside. Even if he's not Metcalf full-time, he's outside full-time. JSN will probably be inside full-time. And with Ryan Grubb coming in as the new OC, We'll probably see JSN on the field for like 75% plus of the snap. So it's like who has the easiest matchup running routes this week? It's going to be JSN probably 90% of the time. So I could see a big play, a touchdown, uh, a red zone target going his way. And I think he um, I think he has a, a good start to the season here. Yeah, I don't. I actually don't mind that play at all. I already told you I'm starting JSN in a league where I have three wide receiver starting spots. Just plugging them in. I'm not going to play with Addison this week. I'll play JSN. Yeah. Uh, that said, my deep cut. I actually am going to go back to that Miami and that Jacksonville game. I think Brian Thomas Jr. is a fine play. Uh, you know, first round wide receiver has some big play ability. If they're going to be playing keep up and and. That's going to be Jacksonville playing keep up most likely because Miami scores so much. It's going to have to be somebody in this offense. And if you don't have Christian Kirk, you don't have Evan Ingram, Travis uh, Etienne, the guys that most likely will be the first options. I think Brian Thomas Jr. has some big playability where he could easily catch a long play touchdown or he could have a big, uh, couple big plays in the game where at the end of the week you might be looking at it and saying, hey, he scored me 10, 12 points, and now I feel comfortable with him in my flex. Yeah, I wonder uh, how much Ramsey he's going to see. I feel like the – Dolphins secondary, like their pass rush is going to be down a little bit because of the injuries, but their their secondary is fucking good. You think that they'll just throw Ramsey on the rookie right away? I don't know that they'll throw him on the rookie, but the, uh, he stays outside. I think in their new scheme, he does 
play a specific player rather than staying on a side. Yeah. Um, I, I felt like almost... It's like they're not going to use him in the slot. So no, it's like, it feels... I feel like, like maybe he would play Gabe. Maybe. if That feels like such a waste for Ramsey. It does. I kind of want to see if it's just like a Jalen Ramsey kind of like, oh, like, let me let me welcome this first-round rookie to the fucking league type of beat, you know? Fair, then maybe you just play Gabe Davis instead. Yeah, play no, the other big play no, guy on the other side on of the field. I'll just play Christian Kirk, <laughs> brother. <laughs> that's what I'm finna Fair do. Fair enough. Fair All right, enough. so that's our D cut for wide receiver. Let's move into our streams of thy week. Yes, uh Okay, so let's start at the quarterback position. Listen, I'm just going to go back to Seattle since I've been talking about them the whole time. I got Geno versus Denver. Again, I just don't think this Denver defense is good. They lose their safeties this offseason. They only have Sertan, and Sertan would normally be enough to make me hesitate a little bit against the defense, but, uh, you know, they have a lack of pass rush there. Seattle has such an explosive offense right now. Their line is a little bit of a problem, but without like a real pass rush on the other side of things. I'm not overly concerned with it. The new offense with all these weapons at his disposal, like he just gets to pick and choose who he wants to dump the ball off to. The matchup's not good out there. I'm cool. Gino's got some uh, some leg action going on as well. He could scoot a little bit. So I like Gino. I was going to say Baker Mayfield's a good option as well against the Washington terrible secondary, but Gino will be my pick for the week. Fair enough. I'm, I'm going to go back to that Rams and Detroit game. And uh, the reality is you and I both have Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup as top 12 options, actually top 13 for me, options in fantasy football this week. There's going to be a lot of points scored. You know who's going to be on the uh, giving end of those points? Carson Wentz. It's going to be Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford is going to score. Wentz is the backup there, right? No, it's Jimmy Garoppolo. Wentz is uh, Mahomes' backup. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. He was there last year, though. Uh, I might just fucking making that up. I think up. you might be making that up. Okay, facts, uh, facts, facts But it's facts, fine. Facts, it's facts, it's facts, whatever. Um, maybe I'm, was Wentz a Ram? I kind of feel like he was. Is this a trivia question? I'm not sure. Let me firm. Anyways, let me get back to my, my stance here. We already have yeah, these guys as being big uh, contributors here in this week, and I wouldn't be surprised, you know, just pace of play. At the end of this week, if Stafford has thrown two, three touchdowns and he kind of finishes as a low-end QB1, high-end QB2 this week, I, be I would not be surprised at all. This is the fucking top five QB this week. It wouldn't surprise me. Dude, he, he's going to be a great streaming option for you, and, and the reality is he was going so deep in drafts that – most people, if you're in a one QB league, they might have not even drafted him. He might be on your waiver wire right now. And if he's not and he's sitting on your bench, you probably want to plug him into your lineup. Okay. He was on the Rams last year. End of okay, last year, cool. he played a game or two. Trivia. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with that. Stafford's like the first guy kind of outside of that good tier of players that you can certainly uh, stream. Moving to tight end. I'm going a little bit deeper here, but but I'm sticking the Rams offense. Talked about Puka. We've talked about Cooper Cup. Colby Parkinson is my stream of the week. He is the tight end one. He's a starting tight end for LA with... Uh, Tyler Higby out. They're playing against Detroit. Last year, Detroit allowed the seventh most fantasy points per game to the tight end position. And again, like their secondary is going to have their plate full with Cooper and Puka. Like the middle of the field, I think will just be completely uh, open and in such a high scoring game, anything can kind of happen there. We've seen Higby have big games before where, you know, he's just seen seven, eight, nine targets. And I think what they've been saying out of camp with Colby is uh, kind of indicative of, of the way that they want to use him in the passing game. So I kind of like him as like a third option there. I'm going to go with a guy who is tight end eligible in your guys' leagues. It's going to be Taysom Hill for the New Orleans Saints. Now, look, you talked about with Alvin Kamara that you're worried about some of these goal line opportunities going to Taysom Hill. It does seem like Dennis Allen is actually meaning what he's saying when he says Taysom Hill is going to have a role in this offense. He could be the number one tight end receiving option in this offense and a goal line back in this offense, and you can plug him into your tight end spot. We also know that this matchup here against the Carolina Panthers is a soft defense where, yes, it may be a little bit slower scoring, but there's going to be some opportunities for Taysom Hill this week, and that's all you're looking for at the tight end position. He's probably not drafted in a lot of your leagues. Maybe if you play with some sharp guys, he was drafted. But the reality is you can probably pick him up off the waiver wire this week and get some points out of Taysom Hill. Yeah, Taysom's fucking not going to pop off this week. There's no doubt in my mind. So unnecessarily. <laughs> All right, let's move to streaming defenses. And I will just preface this by saying I, I typically have a little bit of a formula when it comes to streaming defenses. If you're trying to decide between a few that are sitting on the waiver wire, the very first thing you want to do is make sure that the team that you are streaming is projected to win their game. If you're about to stream a defense that's like seven-point underdogs or like four-and-a-half-point underdogs, that's not a good option. You want a defense that's supposed to control their game and win their game. So that is tiebreaker number one. Second tiebreaker I typically look at is them playing at home. And a lot of times that's factored into the spread, obviously, but that's just another tiebreaker point towards deciding that. And then thirdly, I think it can go one of two ways. If the, the over-under is high, that's fine as long as the spread is 
high as well. If the over-under is low, then it could be a, a slow-scoring game. I like higher over-unders. It might seem like, oh, you know, they're, they're scoring more points against me, so that's bad for my defense, but more points typically leads to, if, you're, if you have a big spread, right, you're, you're projected to win by a lot, the other team is now dropping back a lot, which means sacks, it means forced fumbles, it means interceptions and those types of things, a lot of turnovers with high over-under games. So going off of that segment, I mean, we've talked a lot about Cincinnati being eight-point favorites. They are playing at home against the New England Patriots as huge favorites, so they will probably be my number one. I don't know that I love them as an actual pure defense, but like against this New England team, against Jacoby Brissett, like they might let up. 10 points, 8 points this game. Jacoby throwing an interception, it's a lock. I, I actually, that's the first time me hearing your philosophy, but I think my defense meets all of those criteria. You can tell me if they do. Uh, but I'm going to go with the Chicago Bears uh, this weekend. Looking at last year, the last five weeks of the season, they were the second highest scoring defense for fantasy football. And this defense has only gotten better. We've talked about some of the additions that uh, Ryan Pulse has made on this defensive side of the football. And you go into a game this week where you play the Tennessee Titans. Will Levis, how is he going to play? He kind of feels like a question mark to me as well. Somebody who's a little bit careless with the football at times. I think this has the potential to, at the end of the week, maybe even be a top five play at the defensive okay. uh, position. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they do. They're four-point four, four point favorites. They're at home. so it, uh, Checking it the boxes, passes, baby. It passes that test. And I would, I would just throw one more out there. You know, we've been on the Seattle bandwagon pretty much this entire episode. They are six-point favorites at home against Denver, and Denver is playing a rookie quarterback. So that's another little, like, tiebreaker you could sprinkle Hell in there. Yeah. Turnover, pr- uh, where the turnover-prone QB, rookie QB, like, those are ones that you want to attack there, all right? So that will round out our first week one rankings episode. That felt long. We've been spitting for a minute. It felt long, but I, I also Maybe feel like hour? we got enough time to, you know, go a second round. You want to just do week two right now? I'm finna pass. Right. <laughs> I'm finna pass the blunt on that one. Uh, thank you guys for hanging out. Let us know if you like the format of this or is there anything different that you would like us to do. Next week, we will hopefully be joined by Adam as well. So we'll have a third man on the couch so you can hear a third opinion on things. But again, if you want our rankings right now, head over to bdge.co, become a big dog member. The least expensive way to do it, though, is by signing up on Underdog Fantasy using our code BDGE. When you deposit $10 or more, you'll get the rankings, you'll get the waiver wire rankings, you'll get access to the private live stream, you'll get our dynasty rankings for free for the remainder of the season just by going to Underdog Fantasy and doing that. You'll also get that Travis Kelsey free square for tonight, the vulture protection bets, like all that shit. It's all there on Underdog Fantasy, and we are out. Good luck in your week one matchups. We'll see you. Smoochies. Smoochies.